traditional method techniques. So that's why <laughs> in, in this uh, I was asked by Michelle and uh, the other two members of the team, Liliana and Helena. So, to start, uh, Anatolia, yes, this is Anatolia, which corresponds to modern uh, Turkey, uh, is among the earliest uh, regions where communities uh, developed uh, complex metallurgical techniques. Also because uh, of this uh, natural rich richness in um, polymetallic uh, ore sources. Conversely, Mesopotamia, which corresponds to present-day Iraq and Eastern Syria, um, uh, despite being involved in the uh, development of uh, early metallurgy, lacks completely uh, the, the primary mineral sources. So the, the differences in the distribution of these uh, strategic uh, natural resources uh, in these two nearby uh, areas must have been important in the creation and maintenance of uh, long distance uh, networks of interaction and exchange, especially during the uh, late Chalcolithic and uh, early Bronze Age, the 4th and 3rd millennium BC, when uh, the emergence of new social economic entities prompted uh, a quest uh, for natural resources uh, uh, to display wealth and status, <laughs> and among these resources there was uh, also metal. So, um, considerable uh, literature and research efforts have been devoted uh, to the characterization and uh, the uh, provenance determination of uh, uh, copper based uh, metal objects from these. Uh, regions and uh, so a lot of several analytical programs have been done including chemical and isotope analysis and all these analytical programs uh, produced uh, over the years a large legacy data set of uh, archaeometallurgical analysis so the first step uh, in our pilot project was to gather all the published chemical analysis of copper-based uh, artifacts dating to the late Chalcolithic and early Bronze Age, and that were distributed across an area uh, stretching about uh, 1,890 kilometers in an from Anatolia to uh, northern Mesopotamia, and uh, so the data were sandwiched from 41 studies and conducted over almost 50 years and varying in the number of objects analyzed, the region and the time period they focused on, and the analytical technique used. So the database includes um, uh, so the, uh, the, the trace element analysis of about 1,400 uh, copper-based uh, uh, artifacts, uh, all of reasonably known provenance, and uh, analyzed uh, using 10 different analytical techniques. And the time span between 4,000 uh, and 2,000 BC was divided into seven periods, based on both absolute and uh, relative chronology, to obtain like a current chronology for the entire area under examination and uh, uh, each object was uh, then attributed to uh, one of the time periods based on the dating provided by, uh, in the original publication but also by later reassessment of this dating. So the artifacts are from 73 archaeological sites of which 26 are multi occupational so they existed through several uh, time periods, and that's obtaining a total of 122 size period. So, of course, working with legacy data presents the challenge of combining uh, data produced by different uh, analytical methods, uh, and so the, in this case, the precision, accuracy, and detection limits of the measurements could vary significantly, significantly from one technique to another, um, but comparative studies uh, where the same group of 
object uh, was analyzed using different techniques have shown that uh, the results are comparable and they behave similarly in cluster. So uh, we can conclude that uh, data obtained uh, with different methods by different laboratories, in this case, can be used uh, cautiously uh, together. And, uh, and in general, although being uh, originally intended for other purposes, legacy data uh, have great poten uh, potential to answer new, uh, uh, new research questions and develop uh, also new archaeological interpretations by applying new methodologies. So in our case, the new question we are trying to answer using uh, the legacy database of archaeological analysis from Anatolia and Northern Republic is this one. Do these data reflect existing communities in the archaeological record? And can we use these data to independently ass assess existing archaeological interpretations or create new archaeological interpretations of cultural and social structures which uh, underlie the uh, production, circulation, and the use of, of metal objects. So, of course, in doing this, we have also considered uh, we have also to consider the peculiarities of metal, which is not a, a very simple material. It's a, it's a challenging material, especially to track back to its source. And it's because of the the process, uh, the various process. Uh, involved in the transform uh, transformation of the ore into workable uh, metal and uh, might fractionate the impurities uh, which could constitute the, the original chemical signature of the uh, ore source. So in this case, uh, so we take it in, uh, so we, we, we consider in our analysis only those elements that generally follow copper through the process. So uh, that followed copper during smelting from or to, uh, to, to, to the, uh, into the act. Uh, and uh, so, and in the case of likely uh, intentional alloys, we decided to separate them uh, from the rest of the artifacts by alloying the agent identified on the basis of, uh, basis of the cutoff uh, value of 1% for arsenic and also tin and 5% for uh, nickel. So, uh, so we, we, we run the analysis uh, with them separately from the rest of the unalloyed objects, uh, trying to uh, take first the alloying agent out and then including also the other. But we will talk about this later. So going back to our research question, we decided to address this question uh, using two different uh, uh, approaches, and uh, the grouping and the networking. And in particular, we chose uh, two uh, new methods from both approaches. Different spectral analysis for the grouping and mod modularity maximization analysis for the networking. So, yes, now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Martina had this fantastic data set um, that she was interested in, and um, the two methods were easy. And uh, when she, when I heard about this, I thought it would be a great opportunity to. Um, bring a method I had read about from European archaeology, you know, I knew about from European archaeology, from a course I did about a year and a half ago uh, called Mosaic at Kiel. Uh, it was about using R as GIS. And, and one of the things we learned was this two bin inspection um, method developed by uh, Oliver Nopons. So it was a great excuse to use something I've done during the course, but also to, um, to apply the method to a different region and see how it, how it holds, if it works, um, in this new uh, research problem, uh, or if it's 
it may be this specific year. And then also to compare contrast grouping approaches and network approaches. Um, so I've been doing the, the grouping work and Yelena has been doing the networking stuff. We've been working separately uh, in completely different countries, talking about over Skype. And um, and it'd be interesting to see if we got similar uh, metal communities out of both approaches and if not why. So two Bin Spectrum was developed by Oliver Nocklinks. And um, what I liked about it is um, it produces heat maps like you see here. So his uh, study area that he developed this for was Bob and Rotenberg, so right there. Um, and what it does is it compares multiple types at once. So he was using the artifact types in his uh, work. And, um, and then it produces a heat map. This is not layered, stacked layers. They're all the types at the same time. Uh, and, it, and it creates groups from the, uh, more than one artifact type at a time. Um, but then it's not just a pretty picture, this yellow, pink, blue. Um, you also, as part of the process, create sample points, which is what's shown at the top. Um, the, the grid is a, an artificial grid, which gives you lines so that you can slice the heat map and produce um, distance diagrams that you see at the bottom here. So it, it's a I enjoy the quantitative methods. I like being able to get uh, deeper into the data and not just have pretty pictures. And so I thought this was a really interesting uh, method, grouping method to apply that would allow me to really dig deeply into the data. So, uh, right. And so it's not as easy as uh, just formatting your data the same way and plugging it into the code. Uh, this is something both Elena and I have um, learned. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, this is a, we've talked about the, the nature of the data so much, this has actually been uh, really important. So one of the, the first challenges is just the geographical um, areas. It's, our study area is just physically a lot bigger. Um, and what this uh, first challenge uh, causes is both um, the tube inspection code and the code behind the modularity maximization network analysis requires projected data but our study um, area does not fit in a single protected UTM zone, which is the, the projected data for the area, so it's, it's always UTM. So um, we've had to, to come up with compromises. So I just, in my case, I just chose 37N. So the ends are of the study area are a little bit worse, <coughs> but should be within reason. Um, and uh, Yule has had to come up with, up with a workaround in her code as well. Uh, the next one is, again, just this issue of scale. So sample points, in all of the original case study area, it's, it's hundreds of sample points. In ours, it's millions, and uh, my computer definitely didn't like the first number of uh, sampling <laughs> ratio I chose. So uh, this question of, well, it can't just use the default sort of um, sample point thing. I have to actually really think about um, how, how to sample and, and if it's actually physically viable. And, and then the, the sort of one-to-one -one relationship of the, the data. So we are comparing artifact types as such that were found at sites. We're comparing part million values of different elements within artifacts. So the location can be is the site is the artifact. Uh, it's, it's actually the artifact is the answer because it's the unique identifier. And, and again, it's the other issues. So unfortunately, um, at this time, I do not have the answer. Um, these are my results. It's the number 24 uh, a lot of times. I've had that this. And <laughs> um, I do not have the answer um, at this time, unfortunately. Because uh, I, I really, uh, I, I was quite so naive jumping into this, and it's a lot more time consuming and complex to apply an existing method to a new data set, and it's just not happening at this time. Um, but I have had the uh, spatial distribution of um, groups of metal uh, done by PCA analysis, which is something that uh, Elena had to do at the start of her work, uh, just to see what the spatial distribution is like. So you can see there are spatial clusterings, but I mean, there's still some work needs to be done before we can get the more interesting statistical spectrum. So, uh, I have to read this because this is not my work. But so you may have been working on this modularity maximization analysis, which her and Liliana developed for the Balkans. Um, and this is their paper there. Very interesting. And they, they were interested in as well in um, trying it out on a new area to see how it holds up, how it performs, and, and what it does. So, um, 
So this, uh, I'll just skip over to this. So the, the modularity maximization method, uh, it detects communities by searching over possible divisions um, of a network for one or even uh, for more that have a particularly high modularity. Um, so in this case, it's done uh, by applying a Luvian method, uh, which repeatedly optimizes the communities until the overall uh, modularity can no longer be improved, resulting in the best possible grouping of nodes of um, a given uh, network. So the links from the various nodes belonging to the same community. Um, so uh, it's the nodes um, are the, the different uh, sites, and the, the connections between them are actually uh, the individual so, um, element uh, part per million values. Uh, so the more links between the sites, the more individual uh, elements have the same uh, part per million value. Um, so, just gonna skip ahead. so the first step um, is to uh, calculate um, the, uh, a network using the uh, elements of the metals uh, to come up with groups um, of, of um, metal combinations. So the, uh, this was from the original study where they used seven metals, ours has nine. Um, it's turned out a bit weird, and that's also uh, something we're working on right now, but it's, it, it's probably because of the different metal ores that are present in the Near East versus the Balkans. Uh, they have different, uh, just different chemical signatures. Um, then this, uh, these are then used um, to inform um, a site network uh, where, uh, and so the, the connections are based on um, on these elements. Uh, so, so the values, uh, so the values are correlated, uh, and if one element uh, decreases, the proportions of the remaining uh, must increase to get to the sum of one hundred percent, which can hinder uh, the translations of the variables. Um, so she eliminates the correlations running uh, principal component analysis, and then the principal component scores are obtained to calculate the Euclidean distance between all pairs of artifacts. And uh, the modularity analysis of the site is again run using the Alluvian algorithm, um, and, and so there's uh, 10 chemical clusters that are all connected. So this is everything all at once, which is confusing and makes no sense. Um, but you can see that there's three colors, and this is the results through time. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, uh, going back to the previous, uh, uh, yeah, the, the overall network. So, um, basically, uh, so this is the preliminary result after running the analysis only with the group of, of the no analog cover objects. So, um, what we can see here that uh, we can see that we got uh, three distinct communities, yes, uh, structure. We may be representative of copper supply networks, and these images in particular show the Mobius by period. And uh, of course, uh, not, unfortunately, not all the periods are uh, equally represented. So, for example, for the very early stage of the late charcolithic, we do not have enough nodes to create meaningful communities. But we can already see in this early period the appearance of the community structure that we will uh, further, we will we develop later. So we start to have a clear picture with the uh, beginning of the third millennium. So uh, we can notice uh, in general that the most uh, important nodes in our network uh, correspond to large settlements, uh, which are uh, located close to important uh, or rich uh, uh, areas. So for example, where is it? Okay. Uh, so for example, Alajuk, I cannot see from here, and so unfortunately. Here, or also Aslan Kupel, which is near the important copper uh, sources of uh, El Ganimadan, and so on. So, and this large settlement, <coughs> close to our uh, sources, have gathered also other archaeological evidence of uh, inter regional uh, contacts. Therefore, it makes sense to uh, identify them amongst the major players in the manner 
population. Um, as to the links uh, and the community structure in general, two interesting things can be noticed already in this early stage of our project. Firstly, the community structure one and two, which are the green and the violet one, uh, ones, uh, seem to confirm the existence of exchange networks spanning from uh, Detroit, so the western, so the main, uh, western Anatolia, to uh, northern Mesopotamia. So uh, this map, uh, and in particular growing up inland, is try to imagine a map of Mesopotamia and Anatolia in the background <laughs> of each uh, image. And uh, so going both inland and uh, along the southern coast of uh, of, <laughs> of uh, Anatolia. And uh, so this network going uh, west and east uh, and vice versa have been already postulated by other scholars, the so-called Great Caravan Route, which was an early version of the old Assyrian trade network involving also metals and which will emerge later in the second um, millennium BC thanks to the appearance of the written uh, documents. And secondly, uh, we can see also the uh, appearance from the late fourth, but more in the third millennium, of the third community structure, the orange one, uh, which uh, will, uh, so, which can be interpreted as the gradual introduction and further uh, expansion of a new copper supply network, most probably originating from the Caucasus. So uh, these are just preliminary results. So uh, the next step, uh, this is an image of the, of the old Assyrian trade networks, which will appear later. And so, uh, what is the next? Oh, yes. <laughs> so the next steps uh, in our pilot project will be for the grouping, trying to, to find a way to fix the procedure. So um, then for both approaches, uh, run the analysis also for the uh, alloy groups, especially for arsenic, uh, arsenical copper and tin copper, and to check out the behavior in comparison with uh, the analloid copper group. And finally, for the data set, we want to extend the chronological uh, range uh, in order to include also the second millennium BC and see how the early Bronze Age network can be compared to the Middle Bronze Age network, which was characterized by the old Assyrian trade